our Bibles and let's turn them to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. All right, remember when we started Acts chapter 9 last time, it started to introduce us once again to a guy named Saul. We know Saul better as? Paul. So this Saul who becomes Paul is this mighty Saul riding on his high horse to Damascus to go arrest all of these criminals that he's calling Christians, or I should say Christians, he's calling criminals, and he's on his way to destroy them. So look at verse 1 of chapter 9. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. Now I ask you the question, why would this man, who is an educated man, a religious man, and a respected man, be breathing threats? threats of rage, pulling out people and throwing them in jail and prison and having some of them executed because of their faith. I challenged and I said, I believe it is because when Saul himself, the scripture tells us, and he's going to tell us himself today in another passage, that when he stands there at the persecution of Stephen, the martyrdom of Stephen, when he sees a man who is literally having rocks hurled upon him, and yet in absolute peace, and praying for those who persecuted him, the conviction within him who was strived at everything to be holy and righteous, but had not the peace that he saw in someone else, that insecurity in him turned into rage. And many of us have encountered that. We're living a godly life in a world where someone sees the peace in your marriage. They see the peace that you have, that you're not trying to climb the ladder and they don't know how to respond, and so it comes back with anger and hostility. And so often when someone is just lashing out at me, I'm just like, where does that pain come from? Where does that anger? Oh, you're a Christian? Oh, you're a pastor? Oh, you're just such a hater. And I'm like, well, which one of the two of us is hating on right now? And so the Lord helps me understand in the same way that I see Saul, that wounded people wound people, hurting people hurt people. And so this is where we see Saul raging. And so he's on his high horse to go and do what he thinks is best. Oh, but God meets him on that road to Damascus and knocks him off that high horse, doesn't he? He knocks him clear off and he takes him into the city of Damascus and leads him to a street called Straight. Hey, Saul, it's time to straighten some things out. It's time to straighten some things in your doctrine and your understanding. And so let's look at our notes. What happened on Straight Street? Remember, last time, this is where Saul was gloriously converted. It's where he really began to pray, not just talk about God, but talk to God. It's where he discovered God's will for his life. It's where he was filled with the Holy Spirit. It's where he began to openly identify himself now with the Lord's people. And he's introduced now into a wonderful fellowship, the family of God, that he never knew that he had family around him. And then lastly, we saw now is when he begins to start to become a living witness for God. So I ended the message two weeks ago with this simple question. So what's your address? Are you living on straight street or are you still on the crooked narrow? Are you still finding yourself filled with confusion and maybe anger and disheartened because I said there is no such thing as a discontented, disgruntled, faithful follower of Jesus Christ. No such thing as a bored, faithful follower of Jesus Christ. When God takes us to straight street and we can recognize that his will and his purpose and his plans are his purpose, will, and plans, and that is where the blessing is, that we can become baptized in the Holy Spirit, find a fellowship and family and all the things that straighten us out. The question is, where were we living today? On Kapakahi Street or Straight Street? Okay, all three Hawaiians understood that one. All right. Kapakai means crooked, all right? Oh, messed up. Boss up. You know, I want you to see this picture here. The Bible says that when Saul had the, the, the blindness, that when he was prayed over, that things like scales fell off of his eyes. I just think that's a gnarly picture. I don't know if I have any point other than just going, that's a gnarly picture. <laughs> no, but really... What happened is that the scales came off of his eyes, and seeing, he still could not see. And you see, some of us, we were asking, are we seeing, but can we not see? You see, maybe today, there's people here who say, no, 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 this is what I see, but how do you know that that is what is to be seen? Or how do you know the understanding? How deluded have we become sometimes on things that we think we see, but we don't? And so sometimes God needs to remove the scales from our eyes. And so that is the context of what we left 
left off last time, so let's go at verse 22, the last verse that I gave us, and it says, but Saul kept increasing in strength. So after all that he's gone through, now he is increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by providing that this Jesus is the Christ. Now, let's pick up today. And when many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him, but their plot became known to what? Saul. Their plot became known to Saul, and they were watching the gates day and night so that they might do what? Put him to death. Now, isn't this very interesting? The very guy that came to Damascus to put the death to Christians is now the one being pursued. Maybe some of you in here, you recognize what that's like. You were the guy in high school that mocked the Christians in college, maybe that work, and you begin to call them all kinds of names and things, and now that the Lord is revealed and the scales has fallen off of your eyes, that which you thought so clearly was a truth, you've now discovered was a lie, and now that you are a Christian, you're on the receiving end of such abuse. Now maybe perhaps you can have compassion towards those who are hurling at you because you were also once in that same deception. He finds himself now the object of persecution. But look at verse 25. It says this, but his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall and lowered him, meaning he couldn't even go out the front door. He couldn't go out the gate. So they lowered him down in what? A large basket. He enters the city blind. He leaves it in a basket. Not exactly a banner beginning for the Apostle Paul. Did you hear me on that? See, so often we look at Paul. We see all that Paul did and all who Paul was, and we quote Paul in our scriptures, but we forget that Paul was first Saul. And what we looked at last time was Saul and his life and where his passions led him. And we're going to look at that again today. Consistently struggles. Basically, at this point in time, Saul is, ready for it, a basket case. <laughs> Thank you. But I'm bumped. Be here all week. Try the veal. All right. Now, here's the thing. Notice back what it says in verse 25, though. It says, but his disciples. The guy's been saved how long? And it says, but his disciples. First thing I want us to recognize is that this shows us that he was a gifted teacher. The verse just showed it just above that he was teaching and he was explaining things. And so he's a gifted teacher. But I want to let you know that sometimes one of the greatest dangers that can happen in a Christian's life, listen, is early fruit. Let me explain. You know, the Bible says not to lay hands on someone too quickly because in that case, they might, they might become puffed up and become arrogant, meaning that there has been pressures and responsibilities placed upon them that they do not yet have the foundation for. So often I have seen people where they just get saved and they start sharing with one or two people and those people get saved and all of a sudden, hey, that's it. I'm called to be a teacher. I'm called to be a church planner. That's what I'm called to do. And they want to run right away. And then it's just door closed, door closed, door closed, and all these things. And yet when anyone says, hey, you know what, brother, we want to first do this. No, 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 no. Look, these people here. And so Satan, he's a great strategist. He's already lost your heart to Jesus Christ. He knows that. But what he can destroy is your fruitfulness by throwing you a few fish. And so when you look at these, then you will fight and you will argue and you will plan your own purpose and plans as we're going to see in the life of Saul. So sometimes the early fruit in and of itself can be a huge hindrance if we do not realize God's word, God's, help me out, will and God's way. That is the whole revelation that we're going to see today in this message. Let's go verse 26. It says this, and when he had come to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples and they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was what? Okay. Now look at verse 25. He's in Damascus. His disciples are lowering him down in a basket. Verse 26 says, and when he had come to Jerusalem. Now I want to show you something very, very interesting. Turn with me in your Bibles to Galatians 1 verse 15. Galatians 1 15. Something that really needs to be brought to our attention today. In Galatians 1, Paul is giving his testimony, and listen to what he says. At verse 15, but when he, God, who had set me apart, even from my mother's womb, he's saying, hey, God knew who I was going to be as the Pharisee, and God knew who I was going to be as the apostle. From my mother's womb, 
And he called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. First of all, God gave me a calling. He told me who to preach to, and that is the... Gentiles, and he says, I didn't immediately consult flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were the apostles before me, but I went away to where? Arabia, Arabia and returned once more, where? Arabia. To Damascus, verse 18. Then, three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him for 15 days. Do you realize that in Luke's desire to concise this entire story that could just go on so long that it would be a 100-foot scroll, that between verse 25 and verse 26 is three years. And I'm going to show you another one of those today. But there is three years right between two verses. How many times have we in our lives said, hey, God... It's time to get a few things done here. You know what you did in Saul and Paul and so on and so forth? God, I've been sitting here for six months. How come I'm not pastoring a church yet? Now, that might be an exaggeration, but some of you, you've given your life to Christ, and you recognize, A, wow, I'm still struggling with some of the addictions I had in the past, some of the old nature. What's going on? Is God not God? What's going on? And we, sometimes we look at verses in the Bible, and we don't realize that there was a process in every one of these people's lives, and we want to just do the microwave, jump to the end, rather than recognizing God's Word, God's will, and God's way. And so here was just three years, and where did he go? He went to Arabia, <laughs> the desert. He goes to desert seminary. Reminds me of another guy, a guy by the name of Moses, raised in Pharaoh's court, educated, talented, gifted, with influence. And all of a sudden, he sees and recognizes the plight of his people and recognizes they need a Messiah, and so he volunteers. And so he steps in the middle of an injustice being done to an Israelite, and he takes the Egyptian and he strikes him down. And not to, does this does not get all of the favor of the people in Israel. No, 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 no. They turn to him and say, who are you? The Egyptians say, who are you? He is threatened for his own life, and he runs into the wilderness. And here's my point. The first 40 years of Moses' life, he believed he was somebody. So God took him to the wilderness for the next 40 years of his life to show him that he's nobody, so that in the last 40 years of his life, he could lead God's body. But we read that sentence, and he was in the wilderness for 40 years, and we just keep going. Should I just stop and be quiet for 40 seconds? Torture, isn't it? <laughs> He's in Arabia for three years. God is at work in our lives. He is at work in your life, and yet we want to get right to the immediate. No, no, no. There was a need for breaking of old ways and old habits and the arrogances of this man, Saul, who had been trained under Gamiel and all these different things. Let's move on because I want you to see this. It says this, that when he goes into Jerusalem, it says that all were afraid of him. He's been saved in Damascus. Three years later, he comes into the city, and still they don't believe that he has been converted. You see, here's an interesting insight. When Saul came into Damascus, he needed a friend, didn't he? He's held in blind, and God goes to Ananias and says, Hey, Ananias, there's a guy named Saul. He needs a friend. Oh, Lord, I know who he is. Yeah, so do I. He's my chosen instrument. Go. Ananias obeys and becomes a friend and helps bring the conversion to Saul. Now he comes to Jerusalem, and what does Saul need again? A friend. So who is God going to send him? Barnabas. The name means son of encouragement. I would love that name. I don't think I'm going to get it, but still, son of encouragement. What an encourager. My point? Saul who becomes the Apostle Paul, who has ministered to so many of us, there was a point in time in his life when the most important thing was a friend. We sing what a friend we have in Jesus, but you know, sometimes we need Jesus with flesh on him. 
And how do we know, church, that there isn't a Saul amongst us who has come in after getting knocked off their high horse, they're coming in and now they've remembered the God that they've heard about from their youth, that their grandma used to pray, and they've come here, and yet what we often do is because we're the family of God and we see each other once a week, it's like, hey, how's it going? Hey, come sit by me. And we spend all this time in fellowship and we miss the Saul's when what they desperately need is a friend. A friend that says, hi, is this your first time? Hey, I've seen you a couple times here. Hey, are you involved in anything? What's your story? Hey, are you married? Do you have kids? Begin to become a friend. And not only that, it goes deeper. Now let's take a look at what happens when we recognize this. Verse 27, but Barnabas took a hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to the apostles. Notice he brings them, excuse me, brings Saul to the apostles and he describes to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and how he, Jesus, had talked to him, Saul, and how in Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. Who is bragging of what God is doing in Saul? Barnabas. Folks, sometimes, sometimes you and I need to be praising the God thing that we're seeing him do in others. You know, it's a little awkward for someone to say, hey, can I tell you how awesome I am in God? The Japanese kids last weekend when I had 10 people get saved in my little Bible study. No, 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 no. Greg Laurie once said, if you get saved and transformed, quit telling everybody how much you've changed. Let them see it. I love that. But church, when we see God moving in somebody, let's become the Barnabas and come alongside and say, hey, have you seen what's happened in Tony's life? Man, since he's got saved, this has happened and some of his co-workers in this. And we begin to brag on what God is doing, but we're also setting a platform for Tony and the effectiveness of the ministry in his life. Let's begin to celebrate what God is doing in each other. Amen? And so Barnabas now brings him to the disciples and says, have you seen what's happening in Saul's life? This guy is legit. I can bear witness with him. And that's what he's doing. Now, after this, it says this in verse 28, and he was with them moving about freely in, what does it say? Okay, I want you to underline that. Speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. And as he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews, they were attempting to do what? Put him to death. Ho, oh, not a good ending to a sermon. This is what I want you to write in your margins or on your notes. He won the debate, but he didn't win their hearts. See, Saul, who had not yet become Paul, and I'll explain what that means because there's actually a difference in the meaning of those names. But Saul is still bringing forth an intelligent, articulate argument that Jesus is Messiah. I saw him and I met him. And so he's bringing forth all of his argument But you've heard me say, you've heard others say, people want to know how much you care before they care how much you know. And so now this Pharisee is now arguing and speaking like a Pharisee because he was trained as a Pharisee. And so he's winning the debate, but he's losing their heart. And so when someone is just called out in their sin, all they feel is naked. And when they feel naked and exposed, they return in anger and rage. Are you following me? You just go to work and say, well, you know, the Bible says this, living together is adultery and it's sin. So you know, the guys are like, yeah, screw you. Because you may win the debate, but you fail to win their hearts. So look at verse 30. This is what's going on. And now, but when the brethren learned of it, that they want to kill him, they went down to Caesarea. They take him to the port and sent him away. Where? To Tarsus. Okay. Where did he go first when he gets saved? He goes into the synagogue of Damascus. What's the byproduct? What do they want to do? Kill him. He now makes it three years later to Jerusalem. He goes into the synagogue and near the temple with everyone around them and begins to minister to the Jews. And what do they want to do? Kill him. So what do they do? They take him down to the port and they ship him out of here. And they send him to Tarsus, his hometown. You know what, buddy? You need to just go home. You need to just go home. 
And what you don't know, and I want you to put it in your margin, that was for seven to ten years. You thought three years was long. He does a three-year hiatus, comes back, full guns a-blazing, and now all of a sudden, here it is, seven to ten years. And why do we say seven to ten? Because we're not sure if that three was then added to the seven more and that made ten, or we had the three and then another ten more when he describes the ten years later in the scriptures. The point is, there are seven to ten years that we know nothing about Saul, Apostle Paul. He is nothing but church-going, pew-sitting, Tarsus member of the fellowship Saul where God had to say, son, it's time to be still and know that I am God. Again, I think something that is so critical for us, but I want you to see something before I bring the application. Look at verse 31. This is so hysterical if it wasn't so sad. So, what is so? Verse 30, when they took Saul to Caesarea and sent him home to Tarsus, so, verse 31, the church throughout all of Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It continued to increase. The last thing a pastor wants to hear is that his church got better when he left. Yeah, church exploded as soon as Waxer left. People got saved, it got on fire, people were growing and everything was happening and there was peace. See, Saul's coming in, guns are blazing. And he had the right intention, but not the right heart. And God said, you're winning the intellect, but you haven't won the heart. Why? Because I have yet to win your heart. I've yet to win your heart. You see, church, last time when we looked at this, we saw that God had a plan. He just said it a moment ago. God had a plan for Paul. Who was he supposed to minister to? Gentiles. Who? Gentiles. Gentiles. Where did he go? Jews. Jews. How did it end up? Yeah. Not good. They wanted to kill him. He won the debate, but he didn't win their hearts. So he goes to Arabia. He comes back, he goes right to the center of Judaism, to Jerusalem, and they want to kill him. I want you to write this down, very important. When we take things into our own hands, we've taken them out of God's. We just heard that God said, I want you to go to the Gentiles. Where does he go? He goes to the Jews because he's got the idea. He's got the plan. When we take things out of God's hands, or when we're putting them in our hands, we're taking them out of God's hands. You see, you can just imagine where Paul's whole heart is, is going, man, God, what I can do for you in this kingdom, man, I'm a trained Jewish scholar. I've got knowledge. Hey, I was a past zealot, an assassin, man. I've got testimony. I'm tailor-made to fit for evangelism to the Jews. And yet every time he went through, the fruit was chaos for everyone. You see, it seems right from the beginning that Paul's ministry to the Jews was a real letdown. He ends up being a basket case. You see, every one of us has one statistic guaranteed. One out of one person will be let down. And not only that, one out of one of us is going to let somebody down. And sometimes I'm not sure which hurts more. I think the latter. When I've let someone down, it bothers me more than when someone has let me down. And here we see this whole beginning of Paul's ministry is a huge letdown, disappointment and delusion. And I'm sure there's a season when he was walking around saying, why, God, why? Look at who I am, what I could do for you, God. Why am I been sent to Arabia and now why have I been sent back to Tarsus? And he's sitting there with this whole question. And yet, as we look later into the life of Paul, as he shares his testimony, this which was seen as the lowest part of his life was actually seen as a highlight. Someone here, this is ministering to you. Where you've been saved and you're saying, Lord, it's been two, three, six years. Have you not seen what I can do for you? Lord, why am I still struggling with this addiction, with this problem? I want to be like the people I see in the Bible that get saved and they get used. Verse 25, verse 26, three years. Verse 30, seven to ten years. 
where God is shaping and molding and flushing out the flesh within us so that when we preach, when we speak, when we live, we're doing all things through Christ, not for Christ. Amen? Do you hear me on this? This is so important. When we look at our lives and go, God, I've been saved for three years now. Get on it. Why am I still struggling with these things? You see, Paul had a passion. His passion was lead the Jews to Christ. That was the burden. He says it in Romans 9. If I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are the Israelites, he's saying, you know what? God, I would take the deal that if you would send me to hell and you would save all the Israelites, I'll take that deal. Wow. This is not a man who is just rambling. He knows what hell is about. He is a scholar. He's been looking and studying and understanding. He's the one that speaks in Romans 8 about what it means to be separate from God. And he's saying with this much passion, I love my people. Yet when we take things into our own hands, we take them out of God's. God had a calling for his life, and it was to speak to the Gentiles. Now, let, let, let's get something, first of all, and understand this. We live by promise, not explanation. Do you hear me on that? We live by promise, not explanation. What do I mean? We always want an explanation, don't we? But in reality, it doesn't fix a thing. If you all of a sudden fall down and your leg is killing you and it's excruciating pain and you go to the doctor and they do an x-ray and they see that it's broken, they now can explain to you why you have the pain. But does that help the pain at all? No, it's when they say, okay, we're going to put a cast on it. We're going to put a pin in here. We're going to do this, and we're going to give you this little thing that's going to help you with the pain. <laughs> we are now living on the promise that we are moving in the right direction for healing. Are you tracking with me? And so often we are quagmire and we're stagnant because we are saying, God, explain to me why I'm benched. Explain to me why my ministry hasn't happened. These three people here. So often I've seen the guy who has these three people and nothing else is happening. And what did I say several weeks ago? A true disciple makes disciples, not followers. And all of a sudden they pour into it and feel that this is their need and their calling or they've tried to do this home group or tried to do this and that and nothing is flowing. Why? Because it's not done in the Spirit. You see, the fruit was chaos. So what did it take to break the pain and get Saul on the train? What did it take to break the pain and get him on the train? The answer is very simple. Psalm 46.10. Be still and know that I am God. Saul, like many of us, was a doer. He was, God, just tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do it. And God said, sit. And he said, okay, but what do you want me to do? And he said, sit. So he spends three years in Arabia. And, okay, what do you want me to do? And he said, Sit. Some of us here, God says, hey, you're saying, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it for you. He says, great. He invites you and opens a door, and you see that door, and you're like, yeah. And he opens that door, and you go through, and it's a completely round room with one chair right in the middle. God, no. But God is at work even in the silent times. Amen. Hey, church. When I was in cemetery, I mean seminary, <laughs> um, I was ministering to kids on the beach, watching lives get changed, salvation come. And then the church that I was working at said, hey, we see God's hand on you. We want you to go to seminary. They paid for me to go up to seminary. And here I am in Pasadena. I'm a beach guy, and I'm in this city of Pasadena. Not only am I in Pasadena, but the library is this four-story, and two of the floors are below ground. You can't get any more depressed for me than below ground. No light, no windows, no sunshine, and I'm below ground, and I'm reading this book on all these dead Germans. <laughs> So this dead Karl Barth says this, and so on says this, and so I'm reading out all these dead Germans had to say about Jesus, and I just closed the book. And I said, Lord, what am I doing here? I want to serve you. There's kids going to hell on the beaches of San Clemente. I want to serve you. What am I here? And as clear as I'm talking to you today, there was one of those audible times, full on Jesus bumps, God spoke to me and said, clearly, 
you are serving me. Sit down, shut up, and read. <laughs> I mean, it was like, did anyone else hear that? <laughs> it was, whoa, because my vision for my life was this big. I didn't see anything past the beaches of San Clemente. I didn't see that I would be used to be debating in universities at USC, UCLA, UCLA, UCSB, discussing with all these professors that they all look like Colonel Sanders for some reason. <laughs> but I had the ability and the education to be able to articulate and say, well, I've actually read the Coptic text. Well, yes, I know what Boltman said. Yes, I understand what's going on here in this context and be able to bring a doctorate to the floor and to the table and be still like, yay, but at the same time say, hey, I hear you, understand, but this is why the argument is empty. My vision for me was this, but God said, there are things far beyond that I will have you do. Does that make sense to anybody? And so God is calling us for times of preparation, but this is my favorite thing. Saul, Paul, in his own words, tells us of this struggle. Look, with, cheat with me, go ahead to Acts 22. Let's jump a couple chapters ahead and go to Acts 22, verse 17. Acts 22, 17. When he's telling his story, he says, and when it came about that when I returned to Jerusalem, what we just read, we go to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I fell into a trance and I saw him saying to me, make haste and what? Yeah. Isn't that hysterical? I'm in prayer and God comes to me and says, get out. Get out of here. He says, make haste. Get out of Jerusalem. And what does it say? Quickly. He says, bro, get out of here quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. So here he's testifying that I was in prayer and God comes to me and says, hey, you need to go. They're not going to receive you. So that's the hysterical part because God just told him what he was going to say. I'm now look at verse 19. And I said, uh-oh. God said, and now he says, and I said, and I said, Lord. They themselves understand that in one synagogue after another, I used to imprison and beat those who believed in you. And the blood of their witness, Stephen, was being shed. I was standing by and approving and watching out for the cloaks of those who were slaying him. And he, God said to me, what? Go, for I will send you far away. Where? To the Gentiles. Do you realize what he just clarified to us? He was arguing with God. God said, here's what I want to do with you. And he said, no, 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 God, you're missing it. Wait, let me make it clear for you, God. You're missing it. Remember me, the Pharisee? I should be with the Jews. You're missing it, God. Hey, you, me, my testimony, we got him. We got him, Lord. You're missing the big golden plan right here. And God says, get out of here. Because not just his word, not just his will, but what? His way. Right under the spout where his blessing comes out is his word, will, and way in obedience to Christ. And so he's arguing with God. And Oh, let's not pick on Paul. How many times have we said, oh, God, you're missing it. We'll be in church and we'll see a particular girl. Oh, Lord, look at her. What you and I could, what she and I could do in the kingdom for you, Lord. <laughs> Let us see what an awesome man of God I am. All the way around, Lord, look at him. Oh, gosh, Lord, what we could do as a family for you. Lord, you're missing the opportunity. Lord, if you just give me this job, what I can do in this job for you, Lord, you're, you're missing it because you want to be the manager and God wants you to be the janitor. And you said, Lord, your will be done on earth. And he says, great, janitor. And you're saying, no, manager. <laughs> but Lord, as manager, I can da-da-da-da-da. And he says, yes, but as janitor, you can have a humble voice and talk about the joy of the Lord. I don't need a Mercedes to tell people Jesus rocks. And you see, so often we've argued with God. So don't you get it? You're missing it. God, why am I on the sidelines six, five, ten years later? Lord, what's going on? You're missing it. And God says to Saul, hey, get out. You're going the wrong direction. And I want to say this to somebody here. Matthew 11, verse 28, Jesus says, you know the verse, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you what? 
I will give you rest. Rest. Rest from what? Well, obviously from works trying to be spiritual enough or religious enough. God says, no, it's not about what you do, but it's what I've done. But there's a greater rest that he's speaking about. This is rest in your heart. See, some of you here today, you may have rest in recognizing that Jesus is your salvation, but you do not have rest in your heart. You're here today, and you are exhausted on the inside. You had nine hours of sleep last night, but there is no rest in your heart. It's still in turmoil. You've yet to find straight street because, well, perhaps someone let you down or life has seemed to be a let down from your expectations. What's the key to frustration? Unmet expectation. And so you've seen this letdown, and so your heart is heavy, and there is no rest. Someone in a relationship has wronged you, and so you're holding on to this, and so your heart feels let down. And right now, like Paul, you just feel like a basket case. You can sing, you can praise, but there is no rest where it matters, and it's in your heart. And this is where Saul was because he was trying to inflict his understanding, his will, and ask God to bless Saul's plan rather than Saul say, I want your word, your will, and your way. Amen? I want to encourage us here today to really be like the later Paul we will see who will trust God for the bigger picture. I was looking at this one book and saying, God, why am I reading a book? And he was saying, because I will have you before men smarter than you, and I am equipping you for an hour such as this. Some of you on the sidelines right now, Lord, how come you didn't just take the drugs and alcohol away? Because you know what? We go through what we go through to help others get through what we've gone through. And so some of you are struggling. Why? Because God says, in that struggle, you're going to find someone else who's struggling. You can say, yes, been there. You see, we find ourselves so often saying, Lord, not your will, but mine. But for these seven to ten years, I'm sure Saul was just saying, Lord, you're missing it. Don't you know what we could do together? And he says, yes, and I'm doing it. I'm removing Saul so that I can turn him into Paul. Church, most of you don't know this, and I didn't say this in any of the other sermons, but God just reminded me, that's why I go by Waxer. My birth name is David. I had people show up to my wedding, and my dad says, David, do you receive Cindy? They're all, David? (laughs) I thought Waxer was marrying her. (laughs) Yeah, because there was a time in my life when I went from David to this guy, Waxer, that God had called. Set aside everything that was preacher's kid, this, that, all this other stuff, the Lord had to completely kill me so that then I could be a guy who was doing his best at being dependent upon the Lord. You see, folks, there is a process that God is at work in all of our lives. And listen, you know when you are done with that process? is when there's six feet of dirt on top of you. Then we get our glorified bodies. Amen? You see, this is the whole thing. We're either going to get bitter or better if we can realize that God does cause all things to work together for good. So when we're getting let down a wall in a basket, Paul looks at that not as a low light, but a highlight because he understood that's when God was breaking me to get out of the way of God's word, will, and way. That's crucial for every one of us. I want you to write this down in your notes. God does not close a door that he hasn't already another open. It's one thing I know in my 45 years of walking with Jesus, and that is that God does not close a door that he doesn't have another already open. But listen, Christian, that door may enter into a room that's round and has only a chair in it. Where he says, hey, let's have a chat. And some of us, that's the most nervous thing in the world. Our butt just starts wiggling. When God says, look at me, eye to eye. Look at me, eye to eye. And you're like, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh. No, look at me right here, Uh uh-huh. Because we know that the moment we stare into those eyes, 
Niagara Falls. And some of us are holding back Niagara with every ounce of strength that we can. And God says, that's why I can't bless you. Because you haven't let me all the way in. We go through what we go through to help others get through what we've gone through. So if he's chiseling and molding us and making us, I have a motto in my life. It's better to have God molding you than you molding. (laughs) So every blow, every discouragement, every letdown, every basket case decision that I make, I am reminded, well, it's better to have God molding you than you molding, waxer. (laughs) And God is at work in my life. You know, Jaden has a lot of incredible albums, but one of his, my favorite albums of his is this album on hymns, because I, like many of you, grew up in the church, and so those hymns mean a whole lot to me, and he does it in a very contemporary way. But one of the most powerful hymns came to my mind while I was working on this message. It's entitled, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Do you remember that one? Have Thine Own Way, Lord? Okay, let me sing it for you. Just kidding. (laughs) Some of you got real scared right then. You know, check this out. Look overhead. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. What? I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will while I am what? Waiting. Waiting. What's the next word? Yielded. Yielded and what? Okay. Now, isn't that so beautiful? It's so poetic, and we read that or we sing that, and we go, ah. Okay, let me take you back to 10th grade art class. First thing you do is you get the clay, and what do you do? You slam it on the table, and then you punch it, and then you flip it over, and you punch it, and then you fold it over, and you punch it to get all the air bubbles out of it so that when the heat comes on in the kiln, it won't explode. And then, all of a sudden, it goes on this wheel, and you step down on this thing, and it starts spinning. Thou art the potter. (laughs) I am the clay. We sing, oh, how beautiful. (laughs) And then all of a sudden they start pulling on it and then sticking their hand and then pulling it up, then taking a string and cutting the whole head off. (laughs) Thou art the potter. I am the clay. And then he says, mold me and make me. (laughs) After thy will, while I am waiting, (laughs) yielded, and still. Liar, liar, pants on fire. (laughs) Have thine own way, Lord. Search me and try me, Savior, today. Wash me just now, Lord. Wash me. That means we recognize we're dirty. As in thy presence, humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, wounded and weary. Help me. Oh, finally, we're coming to that point of humility. Power, all power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. It's not what I can do for you, God, but it's what I know you're still doing in me. Have thine own way, Lord. Hold all my blessings, being absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see Christ only, always. Where? The only way that they're going to be able to see Christ living in us is when it becomes clear enough that he can shine out of us. And so God has some of us on the wheel. And that wheel might even be stillness. But God is at work. Amen? God has a plan. A plan to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a future and a hope. And I got to tell you, I was probably more blessed than anyone last weekend on what I saw. Because thank you again for letting me go to the Big Island and to do the installation for David. But what many of you don't know is is that 16 years ago when he got saved in Molokai, he was filled with nothing but hate, rage. First three times he saw me, all he wanted to do was to beat me up and to ship me off the island. He could not stand anyone of Caucasian and could not start a sentence without the word F and then the last name Howley. 
and he gets radically saved. And so when he gets radically saved, people are noticing this change of this angered drunk who immediately no longer desire for alcohol, no longer this. He starts meeting with me daily after work, becoming disciple, and starts telling people about Jesus. He stands in front of the whole island at a crusade and says, would you forgive me for all the things that I've done and driven in front of you and done all kinds of crazy things on this island? I've been ashamed. Would you please forgive me? People are like, wow. He starts doing a little Bible study. People start getting saved. And so Dave all of a sudden has this desire, man, I want a pastor. This is what I want to do. I feel a call to be a pastor. And so when God calls us out of a Molokai, like I told you, when he sold my house and right in the morning and the day, and boom, done. He says, hey, can I be the pastor of the church of Molokai? I said, well, I'm not God. I just work for him. But let's see if God's in it. Let's give it a three-month interim and let the elders and everybody watch and see. Well, it became clear in the third month that it was not yet. All kinds of things happened. Chaos ensued. And so he steps down. Then he spends a little bit of time on the side. Then all of a sudden he comes here to Oahu. He helps me for the first year. He's like, I think it's time for me to go plant a church. And I said, well, let's see if God's in it. And so he gets a team of people together and starts going around and they're praying and they're gathering. And for six months, they're looking for places and property and where to meet. All of a sudden, the whole thing starts falling apart. Chaos ensued. Why? Because, again, it was David's heart and David's desire, but it wasn't God's time. And he continued to pursue all of these different avenues until then, once he comes over here, he tries to do it again with another ministry, and it doesn't happen. It was only because God knew that what he needed was that time of squeezing everything out and the right partner, Anne, and the right people to come around him, like Tisa and, and Eli and others, that when I went there to Imiola Church on the Big Island, I have never seen a fit so beautiful that my brother raised in Molokai, Hawaiian, bringing all the understanding of Hawaiian culture to this church so Hawaiian that the entire thing is koa. Walls, ceiling, chairs, everything, koa. And it's so beautiful that they would come up and hug me, bear hug me. Aunties, thank you. Thank you for pouring into our kahu. Thank you. We are so blessed. They were loving me. And I finally got up to the pulpit and I said, hey, listen, everything that you see in Pastor David that you love, I take credit for. <laughs> and anything in his life that still needs work, I blame that on Molokai. <laughs> and they all chuckled and laughed and I just shared with them, you know, it's the work of God. And so when you understand that, then understand what John Corson says as I end this message, because he said it better than anyone could. John Corson says, the churches were edified and multiplied. When? When they got rid of Paul. <laughs> Paul, who had such a heart for the people of Israel and was finally sent out of Israel into Gentile territory where he would spend the next seven to ten years living in obscurity in Tarsus. Maybe you can relate. Maybe you were saved 10 years ago and you had such a vision, such a desire to be used in ministry or service. You thought, I am tailor-made for this and I've got to call upon my life for this and you've tried, but it just didn't work out. Maybe for the past 10 years you've been waiting, wondering, is the Lord ever going to use me? Be of good cheer. The man who would turn the world upside down, the most important preacher of all time, the most powerful person who has ever lived, except for the Lord Jesus Christ, had to first experience shut doors, shut doors, shut doors, and then 10 years in sitting in Tarsus while the Lord reworked and rewired him. The Lord is doing that in your life. Don't be discouraged. Don't throw in the towel. Don't walk away. Let him do his work and have his way. Go with the flow. Put away your agenda. Get back to basics and say, Lord, what will you have me do today? Amen? Let's today be faithful and full of faith with what God has given to us. Amen? Well, before we pray for one another, I know this message is predominantly to the church and to the believer. But if there is anyone here today who, as you've been listening to this message, the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you and saying, yes, you see what I want to do in my people, and I can't yet because you've yet to surrender your life. You've seen other things that maybe have held you back or whatever it would be. And maybe you've believed, but you recognize you've never surrendered. And so for that reason, I can't do anything in you. But today you recognize your need for a Savior, and it's Jesus Christ. He died on the cross to pay that price for your sin. And today you want to start that relationship and letting God begin to change and transform you from the inside out. 
It's not what you got to do for God. It's what God's going to do in you. But if that's you today and you need to make that start, would you raise your hand? And I'm just going to lead you in a prayer because you're not joining a church. You're coming home to Jesus, who is your Father, Savior, and God. Is there anyone who needs to make that decision today? I'm not going to hold it up long. If you know it and God's been beating on your heart, let's start that process today as a family member. Be born again today. Is there anyone in here that needs to make that decision today? Then church, let's understand that as we are at work, God is working. Amen? Heavenly Father, I thank you, Jesus, that even in the still time, is some of the most productive time for you. And what we think is waste, Lord, it's because we only know how to base our value on our performance, on productivity. We're addicted to it. And yet, Lord, help us to know that some of the most precious time is what Mary chose, and that is to be still. Forgive us for our Martha mentality, God, of doing, 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 and expecting, expecting, and saying, Lord, if you'd only been here two days earlier, you could have saved my brother. Lord, forgive us for imposing our agendas upon you and then being frustrated. Lord, where are we in the process of your plan today? Can we be still? Mold us and make us waiting, yielding. For we believe and know that God does cause all things to work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And so, Jesus, today, for those who have been hurt and feeling lonely and feeling abandoned, Lord, let them know that it's the last thing you've done. But what you are waiting for is surrender so that you can be about your business rather than busyness. Lord, there's some with heavy hearts today. Their hearts need rest, and you know it. But it isn't until they yield can you bring in that yoke that's easy and that burden that's light. For those who are heavy-hearted and heavy-burdened and laden, Lord, come, come right now upon them, Jesus, to let them know they can leave it at the altar. They can leave it at your feet. Some of you have a heart for something, and yet you haven't seen the fruit in it. Is it maybe because you have a heart for but not a calling to? If God has given you a calling, have you been walking in it? Because if not, I'm going to also tell you that comes with a sense of confusion. For only when we walk according to your word, will, and way, Lord, have I found the peace that passes understanding. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Take a moment now, Christian, and reflect upon this message that he brought you to today. What is your takeaway? What has God been speaking to you? Hey, thank you for spending your time with us today at One Love Ministries and being a part of our program. But this invitation that you heard today through the Word of God is directly to you. And I want you to know if you have not yet made a profession of faith, meaning ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, that invitation is available to you right now. Change, transformation, all the glorious things that God wants to do are available to you, but you gotta ask. You must personally invite Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. So if God has been speaking to you during this message, your heart's been beating, your hands been cutting kind of sweaty, you've been wrestling with things, guess what? That's the Lord knocking on your heart. And I want to lead you right now in a prayer that can allow you to invite Jesus Christ to become your Lord and Savior and open the door for eternity for you and Him to be together. I want you to pray with me right now. It's not a magic prayer, but an honest heart that will invite the Lord into your life. Join me right now. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I ask you to forgive me and to become my Lord and Savior. Today, Jesus, I believe that you are God and that you saved me and my faith will be put in you. Please give me your Holy Spirit to come in and upon me that I might learn how to live as a child of God. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. And today, I come home. In your name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with us, we are excited. The Bible says the angels in heaven are rejoicing and we want to join them too. So would you call this number right here on the bottom of the screen and let us know. We want to help you find a church that's in your area. Get plugged in, get fellowship, get disciple as the Bible says. Because we want to grow in God's grace together. God bless you. He loves you. We're excited. 
If you would like to receive a copy of today's message, please write down the sermon number on your screen and give us a call at 955-9335. For service times and locations, check us out on the web at onelove.org. Mahalo for watching.